All right, happy St. Patrick's Day here, everybody. Um, going to do a little bit of review. We talked about Russia a little bit, and um, so you guys know I do have my green on, but I want to recognize I wore Caroline's hat for a little bit yesterday. Today, um, uh, John and Dries, I got part one on here in 1776. Until it gets too hot, I may have to um, take it off. So yesterday we talked about the end of Midway, and we talked about the invasion of Guadalcanal. And those things are going to go on in the Pacific. But while the Marines are hard fighting in the Pacific, the Army is going to get its first call to action in what's called Operation um, Torch, the invasion of North Africa. So we're going to talk a little bit about Russia. I'm going to tell you some stories about Dwight Eisenhower and a little bit on this colorful character named George Patton. And then we'll get into the meat and potatoes of Operation Torch um, tomorrow. So, we know that in, um, after failing to win the Battle of Britain, Adolf Hitler is going to lose his mind and he's going to attack the Soviet Union. And this takes place on June 22nd, 1941. June 22nd is the anniversary of Napoleon's invasion of Russia with a massive army of 3.3 million soldiers. Stalin knows that there's troops building up on his border, but he does absolutely nothing to prepare. He's actually listening to um, a Midsummer Night's Dream in a park in Moscow. And the Nazi army, the Wehrmacht, are going to attack in three phases. One towards Leningrad, formerly St. Petersburg. Army Group Center, led by Heinz Gudrain, the Blitzkrieg um, theorist, headed towards Moscow. And then Army Group South is headed towards the Caucasus Mountains, the Caucasus, to get over them where they can get capture the oil fields, the Palesti oil fields, and stop the Lend-Lease weapons coming from the United States. Well, the Soviet Union is not ready, and their infrastructure is destroyed. Their lines of communication are destroyed. They don't have enough wireless radios to communicate with each other. So all of a sudden, Hitler is going for Leningrad, for Moscow, and he's supposed to be going down here to get to the oil fields, but he is going to be redirected. So you're looking at this line, North Leningrad, Moscow to Stalingrad. is going to really change the complexion of the war. This is terrific battle number two in World War II. And early on, the German army makes incredible gains. The flatness of, like, you know, Poland and the Ukraine and Western Russia are perfect tank country when the weather is dry. But some of the roads, well, most of the roads, are dirt, and they begin choking and clogging the carburetors of the German tanks, and the dust is beginning to wear on the mechanical parts. It's fine if you've got mechanics and replacements, but the Germans begin to overrun their supply line. Now, the Luftwaffe has destroyed the Soviet Air Force practically, but it's the supply that's going to cause problems for Germany. Same thing is going to happen to the Allied armies between the end of July and September 1944. You're gaining more ground than you can supply gasoline and ammunition to. Well, in August, Stalin takes over. And the big problem for the Soviets is just before this, Stalin committed a purge where he killed all of his military rivals um, in the army because he thought they were after his power. He is ill-equipped for this. But he mobilizes all soldiers from the years 1925 to 1938. All right, that was like 13 years of graduating classes. You guys are now in the army. 15 million men. And he brings in one of the few remaining generals left alive, Yorgi Zukov. This is where he comes up with the, you get the rifle, you get the bullets that we did with Ryan and, and Felix and run at them and make them exhaust their bullets. This is Zhukov, two-time hero of the Soviet Union. 
and the political wing will be run by a short but terrifying man named Nikita Khrushchev. And the Russians do what they always do. They fall back, burn crops, poison wells, ruin machinery, kill livestock. If you can't have it, nobody can. And by October, when the weather turns cold, things begin to stalemate. It becomes a brutal war of attrition. The mobile, the warm army with the good tank country, the pendulum of momentum is in favor of Germany and Blitzkrieg. Now that it's a World War I stalemate, a, a fight in a back alley where we're just trading punches, this is where Mother Russia specialized. They do much good here. We can take it much longer than you can. All right. So it also is going to reveal the limits of a political ideologue's power. Both Hitler and Stalin thought their ideologies were sound, that if they wanted it bad enough, their side would win. One of them is going to learn this is too much for him, while the other one is not. All right. And so Hitler, who is drunk on power and this exciting ability to gobble up territory, overextends Germany's capabilities. If he just would have stopped where he was all right, at the end of 1940, you know, 1941, he may have been extremely difficult, if not impossible, to dislodge. But he overextends the rubber band, a knowledge I'm going to use a lot here. And by this time, things are going to begin to turn on him. Now, the German army has a lot of men in Russia, all right? Um, Two million men are going to still be there as they keep going. Um, but little by little by little, that 3.3 million is going to get ground down. You can see it's already down to two. And Stalingrad isn't like a one, two, or three day battle. It's a protracted era of fighting um, over an entire year. Now, I could teach a whole semester on Stalingrad, but we've only got like a, um, a few minutes here. And the thing that's going to turn here is some of the Soviets destroying their crops. You see their barn and everything is on fire here. It's going to be the Russians' ability to handle the cold. That looks like a scene from The Empire Strikes Back in the Battle of Hoth, kind of where they got um, the idea. But you've got the Russian soldiers in their yak wool uniforms are able to maneuver. And this guy's got an icicle covering his eyeball. And everybody was a soldier in the Soviet Union. Here's a picture of one of the most famous snipers in all of World War II. And she was a female. By March of 1943, the German army is going to surrender. All right? This had never happened before. And Hitler moves... His southern um, trident, the southern tip of the trident, from going to the Palesti oil fields to going for the city of Stalingrad, which literally has no strategic purpose. Um, but they're undone by their own blitzkrieg firepower as they destroy the city of Stalingrad, making it heaps of rubbles and factories where their, their quick lightning rapid moves won't work. And it's a World War I stalemate, urban fighting in and around the cities. And just as this crisis reaches its height, here's where Hitler shows he's not an international player. He goes on vacation to um, Berchtesgaden. Slowly but surely, the German army freezes to death, and they are slowly um, encircled. And so <clears throat> the Battle of Stalingrad is going to be won. And it is one end of this rubber band that I am going to talk about. The other part of the rubber band is going to be called Operation Torch. And to show um, our ally, Joseph Stalin, that we are willing to fight, he was saying, we're doing all the heavy lifting. You Americans aren't doing anything to help. You're an ally. And we're like, look, Ace, we were attacked by Japan. All right, we've got to focus there, and we've got to get men in the army. We've got to get them trained. We've got to get them built up. So we're coming, but hang on. And we eventually come up with Operation Torch, the, 
The idea is to land in Morocco, which was French, a French colony territory. Now it belongs to Germany. And we want to do this because it's as far away from Stalingrad as can be. We want to stretch the German supply line as much as possible. And it's this crazy, grandiose undertaking. We're going to get troops leaving from three points in Europe and in, from Norfolk, Virginia. We're going to meet precisely at a third and then on time without the German wolf packs noticing this, attack this area in North Africa. And it's going to be difficult because it is the American and the British first attempt at coordination. The Anglo-American alliance. How will this co cooperation work? And up to this point, Torch is going to be the largest amphibious landing ever attempted by the United States. All right, in the war. And then we're going to have this one, then we're going to have Sicily, and then D-Day is going to be the grandmother of them all. So we're going to work out the kinks, and we're going to make many mistakes, and it's going to go terribly. That's your story for tomorrow, but we're going to figure it out. We are going to learn from it, and we're going to take notes. So by the time we start to plan something like D-Day, hopefully all the kinks are going to be worked out. And to do this, coordinate this effort is going to be a guy named Dwight Eisenhower. We're going to tell you some stories um, about him, hopefully, when we return. The big question in Operation Torch is how is Spain, which is fascist under Franco, going to react? They have said that they are neutral, but man, they're awfully close to where we need to go. And this whole thing is going to be planned on the island of Gibraltar, right here where Eisenhower is going to hang out. And we're going to land in Algiers in Algeria, Oran, and Casablanca in Morocco. If the Spanish jump in, that's another 250,000 soldiers we have to worry about. So how are we going to do this? We don't have a lot of intelligence, I'll tell you that story tomorrow. And so we're going to roll heavy. We're going to send more guys than we probably need. And the guy in charge is going to be Dwight Eisenhower. And one of the unsung heroes of World War II is a guy named George C. Marshall. He is going to be the head of the Army, President Roosevelt's right-hand man when it comes to all things military. And he kept this little black book. And when he saw an officer that impressed him, he wrote their name down in this little black book. And Eisenhower is one of the guys that impressed him. He worked with MacArthur in the Pacific. Some people say that a lot of the ideas behind MacArthur's genius were really Eisenhower's. And, you know, General Eisenhower is going to be a lower-ranking guy than most of the guys he is going to lead. But where he is a master magician is logistics and planning. That's fine, but it's his ability to get everybody to work together that really defines him. He's able to salve the egos and work with the really strong personalities to get things done. And fighting in North Africa is going to be German ace Erwin Rommel and a guy for the um, British Army, the British hero, General Bernard Law Mont Montgomery, who, I'll tell you his story tomorrow, is actually the fourth choice, but he is going to become famous in North Africa at a place called El Almi. The guy that we're going to talk about today um, there's Montgomery, and here is Field Marshal Rommel, is going to be this guy, General George Patton. We're going to fast forward a little bit, and then we're going to get back to him tomorrow. And Patton, talk about him for the next five to seven minutes, um, is this unique character. Like uh, uh, Doug MacArthur, like a Bernard Law Montgomery, he's polarizing. You either love him, or you absolutely hate him. And he is picked to lead this invasion force into North Africa. And Patton is this interesting rogue guy. Uh, he um, 
is from Virginia ancestor. He's a Virginia blue blood, and his his ancestors were part of Light Horse Harry Lee's cavalry in the Revolutionary War. Um, his family member fought um, uh, with uh, uh, Jeb Stuart and Thomas Jackson in the Civil War. And after the Civil War, the family moves to California, where they open a, a, uh, a ranch and a citrus farm. And here is young Georgie Patton, who is extremely rich. He is a rich kid. And since they're out in California, he doesn't really attend to school beyond like grade school. He's taught by his mom, and he really loves his mom. And she has all these classic books like the Iliad and the Odyssey and the Aeneid. And she reads about Alexander the Great and Julius Caesar. And, you know, Pat ran around with like a wooden sword and a 22, probably when he was six, you know, uh, riding and, you know, sword fighting and shooting. And one of his little um, babysitters was uh, Colonel Mosby late of Jeb Stewart's Calvary, and he does all these, you know, rough, tough outdoor things, and uh, the ranch next over had a little girl who was a tomboy, and, you know, she's always out there with um, Patton. Spoiler alert, they're eventually going to um, get married. And when he's a teenager, Patton says he wants to be a soldier. And his family's like, what, George, we're rich. You don't want to be a soldier. He's like, yeah, I think I want to be um, a soldier. So they try to get him into West Point, but he can't because he doesn't have the schooling. Like he, you know, was pretty much homeschooled. So using family connections, they get him into the Virginia Military Institute, where if he proves himself at VMI, he can maybe get acceptance into West Point. Well, things start off for Patton interesting right away. He is sent to room with an upperclassman, and Patton is accustomed to, you know, doing his own thing, and he's in hot, muggy Shenandoah Valley, um, Virginia, and he gets up, you know, one of the first nights and opens the window, and his roommate, who's a higher rank, says, hey, you didn't ask permission to open the window. I'm cold. I want it shut. Patton's like, well, dude, I'm hot. That's your problem. So his roommate gets down and shuts the window. Patton waits there for a few minutes, and he comes back, and he reopens the window. And his roommate says, look, you know, plebe, I said shut that thing. And he gets down and shuts the window and says, so help me God, you open that window one more time, and it's on. Patton gets up and opens the window, not knowing that his roommate was one of the heavyweight boxers at West Point. So they get down, and they get into a tussle. And his roommate hits him and drops Patton. And he said to me, I thought he was going to stay down. And this thing like a wildcat sprang up, kicking and throwing and punching and elbowing. And eventually Patton loses. But man, he fought hard. No matter how hard he got hit, he kept getting back up. There was no quit in George Patton. So the next day, he's there bruised and bladdered, you know, you know, swollen lips, busted lips, black eyes. But everyone was like, man, this Patton guy, there's something about him. And he was one of those guys that went 100%. Even before a football game and a Thursday, you know, walkthrough with helmets and shoulder pads, he's still going full go. So after a while at VMI, he proves himself, and he decides that... Um, he is going to go to West Point, and he's super happy, and he comes back to his roommate and says, look at this, you're stuck here at VMI, you doofenshmirtz, I'm going to West Point. And his roommate, they, they never really did become good friends, pulls out his letter and says, yeah, I'm going to, a, you haven't gotten rid of me, Pat. And he's like, oh, flapjacks. Uh, probably a little stronger than that. Patton was known to be able to, like President Washington, to be able to cuss the paint off a wall. I've only got another two minutes, so we're going to have to pick this up again um, tomorrow. So Patton is going to go to West Point. And much like Thomas Jackson before him, another Virginian, he comes in academically behind. But he busts his butt. He studies harder. He goes in the library, and one of the things he was great at was drill. The military part of it just really spoke to Patton. 
The other thing was he was a peerless rider. He was on the equestrian steeplechase team and growing up on a ranch riding horses over the river and through the woods around California, Patton was a master. And he was also a, a very good shot with a rifle and a pistol. And he was on the fencing team. And guys would say, what are you doing? All right, all you do is attack. You need to learn how to parry and defend. And Patton says, well, if the other guy's parrying and defending, then I am going to win. It was attack, 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 attack. They're like, well, George, there's a hole in your fencing technique because you don't know how to dodge or to parry. You have no defense. And he's like, well, then why do I always win? In order to win, you've got to score points. You worry about defending. I am going to attack. And he was on the football team as a running back. And he would run so hard, even when there was no blocking, and he, he was always a tall guy, but not real thick, and he would get hurt, and he'll break his arm, break his leg, and as soon as he could, he was right back in there, and they're like, George, you got to just stay calm, brother. And so nearing the end of his time at West Point, he is invited to represent the United States in the 1912 Olympics in Stockholm, something he takes as a big honor. And on the boat ride over, everyone else is kind of lounging around, eating and getting fat. And there was Pat running around the deck, doing calisthenics, you know, doing you know, deep knee bends. And they're like, Pat, calm down, man, live a little. He's like, no, this is the Olympics. But yeah, man, relax, enjoy the moment. He's like, you know what I'll enjoy is winning. I'm not here for a vacation. I'm going to win a medal. And he was going to participate in the pentathlon, which is part running, you know, swimming, shooting, fencing, and a steeplechase horseback ride. These are all things right up George Patton's alley. Like, he's got this. And he would hire one of the stewards on the boat to throw rubber balls in the water, and then Patton, standing at the back, would shoot them with his pistols right-handed and even left-handed to make sure he was ready. He was honed, he was ready, he was going in to win. And so he participates in the Olympics. And some of the French um, fencers are like, man, you need to learn how to do different skills. You need to learn the parry. You're all just thrust, 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 thrust. And he's like, yeah. And so he does pretty good there. And then... Um, he does very well in the swimming. He does very good in the running. But shooting is where he has really begun to distance himself. And you've got to shoot 36 shots. Patton, with a pistol, shoots his 35th shot. Doesn't look like any way that he is going to lose. And he shoots his 36th one. And on the range, they said, Miss Target. Patton's like, Miss Target, my butt. I haven't missed him 35 shots. He's way out in front. He said, no, check the target. I just Robin Hooded it. I didn't move my hand. My 36th shot is right on top of the 35th one. Nobody checks until later. And Patton falls in the rankings because he misses his 36th shot. But he's still looking like he's going to medal. He's probably going to win. The next event is his best the steeplechase. That's where we will pick up um, tomorrow. Forgot to tell you guys, if you need me for anything, my office hours are going to be from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. when we start the online school portion. 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. You guys think I'm staying up till 1 a.m. to read your emails. That's just not happening. Hoping you're enjoying the patent stories. And if you were one of the YouTube guys who doesn't like me or doesn't like Patton, no one cares about your comments, so you might as well go troll somebody else. All right, see you guys soon.